Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Live with CXPA. It's been a few weeks since I've been back with you, and I am excited to be back and excited for the conversation that we are going to have today. I am Gabe Smith, CCXP. I'm the Content Manager and Associate Director for the Customer Experience Professionals Association. And wow, it is so hard to believe that we are in September. We're a little less than a month away from CX Day on Tuesday, October 5th. I hope that you are planning to mark your calendars for that day because we're going to have a fantastic content program planned for you all that's going to feature um, some really unique regionally focused content so that no matter where you are in the world, whether you're in Africa, Asia, Australia, the US, the UK, Canada, Brazil, Latin America, you're going to have uh, a, a, a feeling of place and uh, feeling a part of the festivities in the global CX community. So um, on CX Day, we're also going to be right here on social media. We're going to be unveiling our 2021 Impact Award winners. Uh, we're going to be sharing some outcomes from CXPA's uh, strategic planning sessions for 2022. And we're also going to be discussing some exciting changes that are coming to the CCA. XP exam. So you're not going to want to miss that. Um, and if you're wondering, how can I get involved? Uh, if I'm wanting to maybe plan a CX day celebration for my organization, check out CXPA, uh, cxday.org for some graphics, some backgrounds, some other cool assets. So, uh, but I'll say you don't have to wait for CX day to celebrate this great community of customer experience professionals. So I want to hear from you right now. Where are you in the world? Uh, where are you tuning in from? Let us know and broadcast as we talk to our guests today. Uh, this program is always made better by you and your participation, your questions, your real life challenges um, really brings the discussion to life and, and uh, helps give it some context. So want to hear from you in the comments. We may feature you and your comment on the screen. So our topic today is moving beyond surveys to achieve customer insight balance. Um, and this is really a conversation that I've been seeing play out on a variety of mediums, whether that's the CXPA blog or um, you know various think pieces to CXPA's member discussion and networking forum. And so, you know, I'm, I'm really excited uh, to welcome our guests. But before I do that, I want to just uh, see where folks are tuning in from today. So we have um, Celine, who is tuning in from France. Hello. We've got Copenhagen, Denmark uh, in the house. We have Walter is tuning in from South Africa. Hey, Walter. And my friend Paulette Carter tuning in from Atlanta. Great to see you, Paulette. We have Pat Gibbons tuning in from Indianapolis. Uh, we have Cody turning in from Kingston, Jamaica. We have um, the comments are coming too quickly for me to keep track of them. We have uh, Adwa turning in, tuning in from Accra, Ghana. Love to see it. Just giving a quick rundown. Saudi Arabia, Ecuador, Nia. As always to see the, the global representation of CX professionals that we have on these broadcasts. So great to see you. Looking forward to your questions. So um, without further ado, I want to welcome our guest back today uh, to the live show uh, with CXPA's virtual studio audience to advance this conversation. And that is Mr. Eric Head, Vice President of Experience Leadership at Verint. Uh, with close to 20 years in the CX space, uh, Eric has worked with clients across several industries to establish their measurement programs and improve the experiences they deliver. He's been instrumental in building Varen's experience management program and client base. He's a frequent speaker on CX best practices, and I can attest an overall great guy. So <laughs> great to have you back on the program, Eric. How are you? Hey, thank you so much, Gabe. It's great, great to be here as always, and uh, great to see, like you said, representation from around the world. The uh, CX community is strong. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, Eric, I know the title of this broadcast is Moving Beyond Surveys to Achieve Customer Insight Balance. And so anytime I'm preparing for a conversation, like one of the things I like to do is look at CXPA's member networking and discussion forum to understand, you know, what is the tenor of the conversation around this topic? What are people asking mm -hmm. about? What are people struggling with related to 
customer surveys and customer insights in general at this moment. And so I wanted to share, um, you know, a little bit of what, what I found. Uh, one, th sorry, one thread and comment I thought was really interesting. We had a member in the UK. He wrote in a thread, and I should say the thread is titled, Are Surveys Dead? Question mark. Hmm. said, I would love to know what other tools are out there that would enable us as a community to get rid of surveys completely, as I am now starting to think they don't work as effectively as they once did. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping you can kick us off today by sort of, you know, giving us an overview of the customer insights landscape and, and what circumstances are leading CX professionals to sort of ask these kinds of questions about surveys. Yeah. So, you know, I, I love, love the topic, been doing this a long time and, um, you know, really surveys have been the primary input for, for programs. And so, you know, as, as things have continued to evolve, um, you know, I think this is a very fair and, and relevant question. So um, here's my kind of thought of state of the state of the, the, the market. And I sound like a broken record when I say this, you know, customers are definitely more complex than ever before. More channels and devices and modes of, of interaction. You've got social media as a, as a global platform and a global megaphone to be able to amplify um, voices. Um, and then, by the way, you throw a global pandemic on top of all of that. And, and again, it's a really, really uh, difficult landscape for um, organizations to, to keep up with. Um, it's hard for, for companies to keep track and, and to, to measure and assess the, the customer. So, um, you know, since the dawn of time, as I said, surveys have been the primary fuel and input for, um, for these programs. And, you know, that's the foundations and the underpinnings of what CX, current CX programs are, are built upon. Now, having said that, there are some challenges with this, um, you know, approach, having surveys be your sole or, or even your primary form of, of customer experience input. Um, you know, I would say one of the challenges um, with that approach is it's really hard now to cover the waterfront and to be able to assess each and every customer interaction. I just went through all the, the litany of places that consumers can interact with you. It can be, you know, multiple forms of digital. It can be multiple devices. It can be the contact center. It could be contact center live agent or contact center virtual agent or the um, intelligent robot agent. You've got branches or store locations if you're a brick and mortar uh, organization. So it's really, really hard to um, survey at each and every one of, of those touch points. Um, the other, I, I would say, issue is even if you can and you have the ability to measure at each and every touch point, we have a lot of clients, by the way, that, that do this today. Um, surveys are becoming so ubiquitous and, and dare I say, even obtrusive. And you know, survey fatigue is real. Let's just let's just say that out loud. And you know, I think this is why CX pros are now starting to question the questionnaire, if you will. Yeah, yeah, it, it's so interesting. And you mentioned, you know, the the so many channels and 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 so many potential points in which we can gain some insight. And you know, surveys are are inherently sort of backwards looking. And you know, I sort of was struck by this realization the other day. I was going through a, a McDonald's drive through with my five year old daughter, <laughs> and we we're getting a Happy Meal, and I happened to have a coupon on the app for a free Happy Meal uh, with another purchase. And so I, you know, I get out my phone and they're, they're scanning the QR code and my daughter's in the backseat. She says, why do you have to get out your phone when you're buying a Happy Meal? And <laughs> That's great. It, it, you know, in my head, I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> well, I have to get out my phone when you're buying a Happy Meal because uh, McDonald's wanted to give me a coupon so they can better understand what I'm buying. And then so they can tailor offers that they're giving me so that I want to come back and get many, many more Happy Meals and Big Macs and anything else because they're learning about me. That's why they give me a free Happy Meal. And that's why I have to use my phone. All that went through my head. I didn't say yeah. any of that. Uh, I said, oh, you know, I don't know, what, whatever. But, it, it, you know, it's, 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 it's really fascinating because, you know, it, there are just so many ways in which um, organizations can gain insight about their customers now. Yeah, no, that, that what a great anecdote and, and what a great um, lesson for your daughter to be learning at a, such an early age, right? I mean, to be learning about loyalty programs at that age, she's going to be um, well ahead of uh, ahead of the curve there. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. Um, loyalty programs have always been a great way to um, 
gain or have permission to gain more intelligence about you as a, as a consumer. It's that, you know, quid pro quo, um, you give me stuff and in return, I let you track my activity and um, know more about me, which is great. There can be definite, you know, bias um, for those that are surveyed that are more loyal. Um, but I always think about, boy, what about the people that aren't in the loyalty program? right? They're the ones that you want to get to so that you can convert them into a more loyal customer. And so, you know, that's, um, that's always so, sort of the conundrum of loyalty programs versus those that you want to, you want to flip into the loyalty program. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we've already got some great dialogue um, going in the comments right now, right now, Eric, and I want to share a couple that have come in. Yep. Um, Walter says surveys don't really unlock true customer insights as customers perceive surveys as time consuming and spam uh, during the current climate. Uh, Jay disagrees. He says, if you design yeah. a good survey, then it should be a sufficient opportunity for a customer to share their voice. I'm going to ask you to wait, wait in here. And thanks for uh, having a great, uh, you know, respectful dialogue, Walter and Jay, but Eric, yeah. I want you to wait in, wait in on that debate. What's your thoughts? Well, okay. So um, at the risk of sounding like a politician, I actually agree with both Walter, <laughs> Walter <laughs> and, and Jay. I, no, they're, they're both absolutely uh, correct. Um, you know, surveys, um, you know, done upon completion, that's typically when, you know, you, you take a survey is after you've completed a task, right? And, um, you know, typically, you obviously don't want to interrupt a moment of truth, right? So I think that's part of what, you know, Walter is saying here. But um, for those that complete the task, and I'll use digital surveys as the example, um, you've had a successful event. It may have been painful. You may have struggled with it, but you you were successful. And so the data is going to tend to skew to the positive. What about those people that don't accomplish their task and struggle and then don't want to give you any feedback or take a survey if given the opportunity. So, um, you know, I think that's that's part of the the dynamic of where we now maybe need to evolve or move beyond surveys or at least supplement and augment surveys as a as an input. Now, um, Jay's um, uh, disagreement, again, I, I, I love it. I appreciate the, the comment um, and I, I don't disagree. You know, there are good surveys and there's the right way to word questions and there are bad surveys and the wrong way to word questions. And it really is, is a science in terms of the wording, in terms of the order of the questions, in terms of the length of the survey, um, you know, when and where you want to deploy a survey, is it going to be a random intercept uh, on a website to every nth visitor? Or do you want to have an uh, open always on feedback badge, you know, as, as the mode. So, um, my organization, and I've been doing this for 20 years, and again, I feel like we've really got got it down in terms of how to write the perfect questionnaire. And, you know, I would 99% of our clients today do use some form of survey. So, um, you know, I, I agree. I agree with Jay and, and it can be done right and should be done right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, one of the things I, I like on this program is that we try to paint a picture of, okay, what does success look like if we are moving towards a more balanced insight program? Uh, again, you work with a lot of clients on this. What, is, what does that look like? What does success look like? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, definitely it's, it's like your diet. You need a, a well-balanced, well-rounded diet to be healthy, right? And I would say, same thing for your CX program in terms of, of those different forms of, of customer uh, input. And um, we subscribe, Verant subscribes to the Gartner um, approach to uh, customer input types. And in those main three inputs are direct feedback from customer, indirect feedback, and inferred. And just for those of you that aren't familiar, I can give you a little bit of orientation there. Um, direct feedback is that, that survey um, input. Um, you know, and, and by the way, let me just say, you know, since we're on the topic, you know, surveys are really, really important and, and critical, um, in the program. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for that. Number one, there is still no better way to understand what's inside the head and the heart of your customer than by asking them directly. And to Jay's point, Jay nails it on the head. If you are respectful and relevant um, in when and where you offer that opportunity, you're going to get enough people that represent your audience types and are statistically relevant that are going to want to give you feedback. So 
again, that's that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing um, uh, to keep in mind that you still need survey questions to generate your KPIs, whether that's NPS or CSAT or customer effort or task accomplishments. Direct survey input is the best way to um, generate your KPIs and then to be able to trend and track and benchmark them um, over time. So again, um, surveys are really, really impor important part of your balanced CX diet, <laughs> if you will. Um, the second mode or type, according to Gartner, is indirect. Indirect is that unstructured type of input. So whether it's it's the written word in open-ended verbatim questions on a survey, whether it's um, community blog forums, it, whether it's social media posts, um, you know, having that unstructured written word and using text analytics as a way to mine that, that's a really important um, piece of unstructured input. The other one, and this is becoming more and more critical and important these days, is speech analytics. So today, when folks don't accomplish their task online, what do they do? They pick up the phone and call. And so having that spoken word, those agent consumer call interactions at scale, to be able to use speech analytics to mine into that, that's a really, really important part of, um, of unstructured feedback. And then finally inferred, this, these are tools like um, session replay. We have a tool called digital behavior analytics. This is for the digital team to be able to recreate a session and be able to visually with your own two eyes, see where the struggles were, to see where the mouse rage was to understand where people were, were struggling. And, um, you know, inferred can also be inputs from other sources like CRM input or financial input or transactional input. So um, direct, indirect, and in, uh, inferred are, you know, the, the three um, types of, of input. Um, and, you know, I would say, again, all three of these are really important today in a modern contemporary CX program. Yeah. Um, Eric, I have to tell you, that's the first time I've ever heard the phrase mouse rage, and I can't wait <laughs> to use it in a conversation. We've and all done it. We've <laughs> all engaged in mouse rage. So, so thank you for that. And you're getting some agreement in the comments here. Um, Copano says uh, it's about combining solicited and unsolicited feedback and having a platform to combine the two. Um, Absolutely, Copano. Yeah. Yeah. And so... You know, as we think about sort of getting getting towards this balance, and, and a lot of CX professionals, I include myself among them, have have spent time, you know, building survey programs, and and yep. to think about change, even if it's just not you know scrapping your surveys, but to to get to a point of balance, you've done a lot of work to stand these things up. You've uh, you've written and wordsmithed and agonized over the wording of these survey questions. You've built dashboards. You've you build yep. a closed loop process. You've got a reporting cadence. People expect this data. There are rituals and routines that come along with VOC programs. So, you know, hey, even though we know there's some challenges with these things, we've we've put a lot of work into them. So, what do you say to that CX pro who maybe feels some excitement at what you're saying, a prospect of modernizing and balancing their insights program, but maybe feels a little bit wary about the amount of work that it's going to take. Yeah, some definite trepidation. Um, boy, it's such a great point, Gabe. Um, you know, as I said, surveys have been the de facto standard for CX input. They, they're they the underpinnings for really all CX programs today. It's what current KPIs are built upon. It's what executives get bonused on, right? I mean, th this, this could be real financial impact, um, you know, to make change like that. And so... Um, I would say the good news is you don't have to rip and replace, right? That you can build upon the foundation and the structures that have leveraged surveys for, you know, for however long um, and, and really start to evolve and, and modernize um, your program. So here are some my thoughts and some tips and maybe you, how you start to evolve and, and move towards a more contemporary CX um, program from a data collection uh, perspective. Um, you know, one thing I would say is maybe think about alternative ways to deploy surveys. So again, I keep coming back to Jay's point, but, you know, there are ways now um, that you can shorten up the length of the survey. We, we have a technique called engagement surveys, which essentially, instead of having to deploy a 30 question, 20 question survey, we ask small, you know, two, three question surveys, but offer it up to more people. So, in aggregate, you know, we're still able to bring those questions back together, 
um, from a statistical modeling perspective, we're able to run our algorithms and our calculations, our regression calculations, you know, from these snippets of two, three questions per, per consumer deployed over a broader base. So that, that's one example of maybe rethinking how you deploy your surveys. I mentioned feedback badges. You know, a lot of um, our clients put that feedback badge post. Um, Delta Airlines is a great example. If you go out to their website, there's feedback opportunities where you can, as a consumer on your own time, decide, I'm going to click that feedback badge and give you my, my, my input. Now, as we all know, that data does tend to skew negative, but still, you know, you're able to learn when something goes wrong. You can do some real-time alerting off that to help close the loop. So um, again, rethinking your current survey length, technique of deployment um, approach. Um, a second tip is maybe to think more about using text analytics. I talk about that unstructured data and using, you know, text analytics to mine through those open-ended verbatim survey um, answers or your social media feeds and your community uh, blog posts. You know, text analytics can help to organize themes. You can assign sentiment and emotion and, and start to, you know, make it a little bit more, um, more structured. Um, along the same lines, I mentioned voice recordings and call recordings, speech analytics. You know, if you aren't leveraging call recordings and speech analytics, that is a wonderful, you know, goldmine uh, of, of, of resource where, you know, just listening at scale to those conversations between agent and consumer, you can start to organize the key themes there. And, and, and you know, you're going to hear things that people won't necessarily tell you in a survey. Um, uh, so, you know, that's another, that's another big step you could take if you're not, you're not doing it. I talked about session replay. So having that replay tool to look at that mouse rage that, you know, Gabe and I have never, um, you know, had happened to us, but <laughs> it, others have, <laughs> um, it's, it's a great way to visually and with clear fidelity to say, Hey, we know there's a problem here. We have clients that will, you know, capture a replay They'll go back to the development team who said we couldn't recreate the issue in the lab in their user testing. And guess what? When they see that and they know what browser type it was and what OS system, they know, oh, there's an edge case here that's causing people to not be able to complete their transaction. Um, you know, another tip would be use your APIs. We at, at Verant, we have a ton of different APIs, open source links where you can bring in your transactional data uh, from a customer or, or CRM data. And you can now tie lifetime value to your segment persona against the CSAT or net promoter. There's a lot more dimensions you can start to analyze if you're using APIs and other um, third party uh, or, or other third party target sources. Um, and then the final tip I would say is, you know, work with your um, CX partner, your vendor to make sure that you can bring all of these disparate data sources into one platform. You can organize the data. You can start to normalize it so that everyone's, you know, looking at the same metrics and then start to be able to distribute the insights to your, your different key stakeholders. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, guest is Eric head on the program and uh, make sure you get your questions into the comments. So we, if you have any questions um, as Eric, uh, as we continue the conversation with Eric and yeah, I, I'm just struck by, you know, what, what you were saying, sort of bringing together all these disparate sources of knowledge and, you know, literally bringing the voice of the customer to the table in some cases uh, can, can make, um, you know, arguments for change that much more powerful. And so, you know, speaking of, of change and arguments for change, you know, you, you were, you were talking to a lot of executives. Um, you're mm -hmm. talking to folks who are not just CX leaders, uh, who are exclusively working in CX. So right. tell me what, what are the conversations, uh, happening right now in the C-suite related to this topic? Yeah, it, it's, um, it's interesting just in general, you know, we're seeing more and more organizations appoint, um, a, a functional CX lead, right? Chief experience officer, or chief customer officer, you know, over the last couple of years, we're seeing a lot more of that in the C-suite, which, which I think is, is good. It's great for our community. It's, it's great for our discipline. Um, and so, you know, certainly Gabe, the, the conversations obviously are a lot more um, strategic in the C-suite. They're definitely more omni-channel in nature, right? Because the executives, they, 
care about the entire journey, regardless of mode of interaction and, and touch point. So, um, but, you know, some themes that, you know, I hear all the time now uh, at the C-suite level is, um, is that complexity of customer. I mentioned it up front when we, when we kicked off, you know, and, and then you, you have the global pandemic, which has accelerated or accentuated any flaws that companies might have in being able to serve their customers. Um, you know, that's a, that's a big um, concern. Um, I'm hearing a lot more about real-time recovery you know, the ability to, when you know that there's something going wrong in that moment, that you have the ability and the tools to be able to recover and close that loop. Um, you know, I, Gabe, you said it well up front, you know, surveys can tend to be a lagging indicator. And, um, you know, the more latency you have in your CX program, the longer it's going to take to recover and the lower probability you've got of, of keeping, you know, someone um, as a customer or, or keeping them um, loyal. So just, you know, some things there, the, the one, I, I will say, if I take a step back, one of the big topics that everyone's talking about and, and really has always talked about over the last couple of years is, is digital transformation. Um, you know, there's been a lot of lip service played to digital transformation over the last couple of years. Um, COVID-19 has really though made it real. Um, and, you know, I'd say organizations that actually took it seriously prior to March of last year, prior to the pandemic, you know, they were not only able to survive ahead of their, um, their competition. So, um, but now, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not a um, slogan anymore. It's gotta be a reality for, for organizations. Um, so, you know, with, with that, um, just, continue my thoughts on, on digital transformation. Um, you know, I would say still most, most organizations have not been able to realize the full potential of their, um, you know, their, their, their digital transformation programs and, and initiatives. Um, and, and you know what I would say, um, over-reliance on surveys is maybe one of the contributing factors to why companies haven't been able to fully realize the potential of, of digital transformation. And, and, and here are my thoughts on, on why that is. Um, if you think about it, most, uh, and I said this earlier, most online surveys are taken um, after a transaction is completed. And again, it could have been painful. It, you could have struggled with it. But you know what? If you got your business done, then in the survey comes up, you know, um, most majority, I don't know, 90% of that type of feedback um, is going to be around digital success. And the other 10% or a very small margin of that survey input is going to be around digital failure. Um, but I don't know if you're like me, what I will do is if I try and get something done online, and I've done more of this than ever before, as we all have in the last year and a half, if you can't get something done you're going to close out of that browser most likely. If you're given an opportunity to take a survey, you're not going to take it, right? Because you want to get your, your task done. And, and what do you do? You pick up the phone and you talk to the company's contact center, the, the live agent or, or a virtual agent. Um, and, you know, those interactions, maybe you flip the dynamic. It's going to be 90% you're going to hear about digital failure. You know, hey, I couldn't complete my task online. The website would let me do this. You know, it's in those call interactions when you're going to pick up on digital transformation or, or digital experience failures. And so I go back to that speech analytics tool. If you're not using that, that can be a really powerful way to understand where there's opportunities for digital improvement, digital enablement. And if you could just reduce, you know, the calls into the, the unneeded uh, or needless calls into the call center at 10 bucks a call, 20 bucks a call, you know, pick your, pick your financial metric. If you could reduce just a portion, think about the cost savings to organizations. So, you know, we've got a lot of clients more and more that are using call recordings and speech analytics, packaging up digital um, failure or self-service failure topics and themes. They're bringing it back to the digital teams who again are kind of blind to what, you know, what's happening or not happening with their, their website. Um, and so, you know, to connect those two anchor points, digital and contact center today um, is a, is a way definitely to, to up your, your CX program. Yeah. 
Fantastic, Eric. Um, got a good question in uh, uh, here on LinkedIn as well that I wanted to share with you. Mm -hmm. um, they ask, do you have any advice for companies with a small number of clients, less than a thousand, low volumes of data create struggles? Yeah, you know, it depends on what type of business you are. But, you know, we work with many clients that have a small universe. Um, I'll use an example, a brokerage firm that they're measuring their agents and they've got less than a thousand agents in their, in their network. But yet what a critical audience to understand if you're satisfying their needs, you know, they're on the front lines with the end client. You need to make sure that you're, you're satisfying their needs. And so small universe, um, but a really, really critical, you know, uh, universe. Um, so one of the things that we do find when we deploy surveys in that environment is and again, this depends on what kind of business you're in. Um, you know, if it's a B2B or again, a brokerage type, you know, financial type world, we do tend to see much higher response rates and take rates, right? Because people need to be have a good experience to do their business with you. So we, we do tend to see larger or, or higher end count um, or response rates. Um, the other things you can do in a world like that is if you know who the folks are, being able to survey them via email links. Um, you know, I wouldn't say you want to do incentives or anything like that, but in some cases, in smaller population clients, we have um, had clients do an incentive to try and get people to respond. So there, there are definitely challenges, but there are ways that you can gather uh, input from a, a lower population environment. Yeah. Fantastic, Eric. And, you know, one of the things that uh, I think this, the CX community loves is to hear about case studies, because um, we've, we've mm -hmm. been talking a lot about, you know, great theory and, and great practice, but love to learn a little bit more about companies and teams um, that you know of that were able to sort of achieve this, uh, this insight balance that we've been talking about. Yeah, great, great question. Um... So I, I was talking about the the speech analytics. So there's one there's one that um, I've got there that I think is kind of interesting. So a, a large brokerage firm, global uh, brokerage firm, that used the speech analytics um, input to un uncover key themes again around digital failure. And um, one of the things they discovered was that there were issues with certain folks on the verbal password reset. And so they they use that intelligence to improve that process. And in, in the year, the first year of uh, implementing that, they saved about a half million dollars. So really one kind of small example with, you know, some real money that was um, saved as a, as a result. Um, the, the same um, client was able to reduce their call volumes for people that were calling about tax receipts. And uh, they were able to reduce that by 4%. So again, assign a, a cost per call and number of calls per month or, or year, 4% for some large organizations can really lead up to real dollars, keeping people self-service when they want to be self-service, but can't have to call in. So, um, you know, that's a good example. And the, the final, I guess, kind of value point for that large brokerage case study was um, they were able to use call recordings and speech analytics to um, increase, increase client retention by 48%. So they were able to understand what was um, leading to churn and, and driving people towards churning or uh, tritting from the, the firm. And they used call recordings to understand ways to, um, to avoid that. So again, some pretty good um, value points. There's another um, case study. And I, this one I can talk about because it's, it's public. We did a blog post on it. Maybe we could we could link the, um, you know, the blog post in yes. in here, Gabe. But um, it's Atlantic Union Bank, so um, eighteen billion dollar bank out of Richmond, Virginia. Um, they um, use us to measure across all modes of interaction. So again, branch, contact center, all the different digital touch points. So they're they're one of the ones that are covering the waterfront with respect to you know all different channels and types, um, and. They're using surveys, but they're also using text analytics. So the structured, direct, and unstructured, uh, indirect, to drive their, their KPIs. And what's interesting, what I think they do that's somewhat unique is they're, they've got KPIs based on um, funnel 
stage of funnel or journey type. So they've got KPIs for prospecting. Um, they track the onboarding process. Um, they track the customer relationship, ongoing customer relationship. In fact, they send a survey out via email on the banker's birthday just to kind of get an overall assessment of how are we doing regardless of the mode of interaction. They've got a, a service set of KPIs. They've got a recovery set of APIs and then an attrition. They're using both structured to, um, to track those KPIs. And in terms of where they're headed, I, again, I think they're doing a really great job. And you can read this in the in the the blog post. Um, they are starting to include C. CX now has. I think we may have lost Eric. Are you there, Eric? I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Can you hear me? There you are. Are we back? Fantastic. Yes. Wait, wait, yeah, where did, I think where we did lost I uh, maybe we, I lost maybe the last the last minute or so. Hard for me to pinpoint exactly where, but I think you were sort of finishing up um conversation yeah. about uh, Atlantic Union. Atlantic Union. So let me I, I was starting to talk about where they're headed. They're doing some really innovative things moving forward. I don't know if you caught that. Um one of the things that they're doing is they're baking customer experience into their governance program. So, you know, instead of just financial considerations, go, no, go on a project, they're baking the customer experience metrics in. And now customer experience has a say in whether it, the project's a go or no go. So, you know, does my heart good to see that, that CX is part of the, the calculations there. Um, they also, they're starting to embed CX leads into each and every line of business. So mortgage has a CX lead, credit card, savings, checking. Um, and, and so, you know, CX is at, you know, in each and every line of business, which is, which is really cool. And then the final thing that they're doing, and again, you can see this in the link, is um, they are creating a function within the office of the president and the CEO for CX. So a CX function within the C-suite to handle complaints, social media, um, customer experience. And one final thing I'll say is that they are now not calling their program customer experience anymore. They're calling it enterprise experience. So they're starting to build the employee experience and engagement into, into their program. That is fantastic, Eric. And uh, we have a question sort of asked and answered uh, in the comment share this and then ask you another question. Um, Cheryl said, what tool can I use to compile both qualitative and quantitative customer feedback from phone, case management tool, chat, portal? Uh, Greg answered that question. So I'd definitely take a look at Varen's platform, um, plug the URL into the comments. Great. But that sort of leads to a, kind of kind of a bigger question, Eric, because, you know, I think that, I think that there are um, maybe a set of questions that CX pros should be asking as they seek to evaluate technology and a technology partner um, to enable a more balanced insights program. So, uh, you know, what are some of the questions that you think CX pros should be asking as they, as they make these really big decisions? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. It kind of piggybacks on the question that was just asked and, and answered in the, in the chat window. Um, so perfect kind of segue. Um, you know, I would think some of the key questions you want to be asking, um, you know, number one, do I have enough inputs that are able to cover all the journeys, all the modes of interaction, all the devices? You know, do you do you have assessment at each and every one of those those key touch points? Um, that's that's really um, critical. And by the way, you need to make sure your different key personas are represented. Right. We all have different whether it's demographically generated, psychographically generated 
you know, you need to make sure the personas are, are assessed properly. So, you know, do you have enough inputs to cover the full journeys and full persona um, landscape? So that's question one. Um, another question would be, you know, how quickly can we detect issues? I said up front, one of the C-suite considerations or topics these days is we want to be able to recover immediately, right? We, we don't want to let any time go by from when a bad experience happens to when we can help to recover that and, and close the loop. So, um, you know, latency is a bad thing in CX programs. So the more quickly, the more immediately, the more real time you can detect an issue for an individual, but also for an aggregate, right? You want to understand as quickly as you can if there's a systemic issue, right? Because every day or, you know, week that goes by and you've got a systemic issue, that's real impact to the bottom line. Um, so, you know, question, you know, the tolerance for latency in your, in your CX um, program. Mm -hmm. back, to the, back to the question that was asked before, um, you need to ask, you know, can I bring everything into one platform? And can I do it easily? Um, how much manual effort would be um, required? So being able to have everything in one place, and, and that doesn't mean you know you have to have one single vendor, one single tool do it all, but the ability through APIs and other sources to be able to bring everything together and organize it and normalize it in one place, you know that's a question you need to be um, asking. And, and then a final question, and I've already touched on it, is. You know, how much manual um, effort do you want to take on or do you want your vendor partner um, to take on? You know, I always say that, you know, the more manual your CX program is, that means you're going to have more latency um, in finding, you know, key insights. Um, you're going to drive up program cost, right? People time is more expensive than, um, than technology or software time. And, you know, you're going to have more potential error if it's manually manually generated. So, you know, you're gonna get errors or, you know, best case, you're gonna get sub-optimized findings that are gonna take longer to get to. So, you know, how much manual effort do you, are you gonna tolerate? How much latency do you want? Those are kind of key questions to, to think about. Yeah, yeah, um, great, great perspective, great insights. And I wanna sort of shift from, you know, questions to ask about technology and technology partner thinking about, about skills that CX professionals themselves mm -hmm. should really hone um, to maximize their chances of success in building and activating this modern, balanced, action-oriented insights program. You know, as you look across the landscape and clients that are successful, can you give me some sense of, you know, what characteristics are those leaders really excellent at and, and what should CX pros uh, look to develop uh, for development opportunities? Yeah, um, great question, Gabe. I, I think there's a couple of things that can help you in, in, in advancement or evolution of your, your CX um, career. Um, you know, one thing, to the extent that you can learn more about predictive analytics, you know, predictive analytics um, is also a key topic we hear a lot in the C-suite, right? You want to accelerate learnings and findings. You want to predict what's going to happen before it ever happens. Um, so the ability, you know, to um, learn more about predictive analytics. Now, that doesn't mean you need to go get a stats degree or a master's in statistics or, you know, um, AI or anything like that. But just the more you can learn and know about, you know, predictive analytics techniques, um, you know, the, the role or how AI can help, you know, in predicting events or, things that will happen, you know, before they actually happen. I think that those are some good skills to, um, to take on. Um, you know, I've talked a lot about unstructured and the text analytics and speech analytics. I think learning more about those unstructured sources, you know, the ability beyond just writing surveys and analyzing survey data, being able to um, figure out ways to leverage text through you know text analytics and speech through speech analytics and, and being able to then marry those inputs with your your direct survey data your quantitative your structured your kpi type data um, you know i think that those are great skills um, to help expand your your cx um, horizon um, and then i guess a final final tip um, i would say is cross train 
if you're in the digital team, get to know what's happening in the contact center. Understand, you know, how they look at the customer and they assess the customer and, and, and vice versa. If you're in the contact center world or operational world, get to know what's happening over on the digital side. You know, there's so much opportunity when you bridge those two functions and you bring them together, you know, in, in a holistic CX program, you know, that's when you're going to start to unlock hidden insights and hidden findings. And um, so it may sound simple, but, you know, cross train, whether it's rotation for three months on the on the phones in the call center or, you know, learning about digital for a period of time, I think yeah. that would be really, really critical. Yeah. And, you know, glad you brought up AI. Um, there's a really great resource on CXPA.org. Um, called a guide to AI, what every CX professional needs to know. That's uh, sort of an independent consensus driven document, a group mm. of uh, CXPA members got together and sort of fleshed that out. It's a great resource on our site. Um, and like you said, you don't need to necessarily be an AI expert, but I think, um, you know, the value that CX professionals can bring as those uh, solutions are being designed and deployed is to contextualize the customer journeys that, you know, those, they're, those, uh, solutions are being designed for. Yep. That's a great resource, Gabe. Um, so Eric, uh, last question. At the top of the show, I mentioned CX Day, October, <laughs> Tuesday, October 5th. Hope everyone's going to join us, but also I have a question for you. What are your plans for CX Day? How are you celebrating ah. today? <laughs> yeah, right next to my birthday or my wife's birthday, the most important day in the calendar. Um, <laughs> uh, great question. So um, uh, I... If you've ever been to Ann Arbor, um, which is where I'm from, where I live, Ann Arbor, Michigan, there is a, a place called Zingerman's Deli. And even if you haven't been there, a lot of people know of Zingerman's. And Zingerman's is world famous, you know, world renowned for having the highest levels of customer experience. They're phenomenal. And, and customer absolutely comes first. And I'm really lucky to have them in my backyard. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm gonna go get some uh, brownies from them and enjoy some of their world-class uh, customer experience. Fantastic, I know Zingerman's well. We get the catalog in the mail with the coffee cake and uh, yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Eric, thank you so much for joining us here at Live with CXPA. Uh, really appreciate your insights as always um, and uh, such engaging comments in the chat. So thanks uh, to all who've been tuning in and asking those questions too. And, yes, uh, thanks, Gabe. Yeah, one last question before you go, Eric. Uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, um, how can they do that? Um, yeah, so, you know, best way is my email address. And I, I saw in some of the comments, people might be interested in some of the things I've talked about. I am always open to have the conversation and to help um, support you in, in, your, um, in your needs. So here's my email address. It's eric with a C dot head, H-E-A-D at verant.com. And um, if you reach out, I'll, I'll get right back to you and uh, we can engage in a dialogue. Fantastic, Eric. Thanks so much for joining today. Thank you, Gabe. Thanks, everyone. All right. Uh, excellent. Great conversation, everybody. So glad that you joined us. Um, as a reminder, you can visit us at cxpa.org. Um, got a lot of great resources. I mentioned the AI guide, but we've got a CX job board networking discussion forum, uh, mentor match program, so many resources to help you propel your organization and your career forward. Um, and again, hope you'll mark your calendars. Tuesday, October 5th, uh, join us at cxday.org and right here on social media, we're going to be broadcasting here for a good portion of the day. Uh, so until then, take care, everyone, take care, everyone, and stay safe.